Well, good morning, Corian Church. It's a joy to be gathered here together this morning. As we begin, I want to look at what the author of Hebrews said about Jesus. If you have your Bibles, turn with me this morning to Hebrews chapter 4. We're going to be looking at chapter 4, verse 14, to chapter 5, verse 10. We're going to look at Jesus as the great high priest, as the author of Hebrews describes him. Listen to what they write of him. Since then, we have a great high priest who has passed through the heavens, Jesus, the Son of God. Let us hold fast our confession. For we do not have a high priest who is unable to sympathize with our weaknesses, but one who in every respect has been tempted as we are, yet without sin. Let us then with confidence draw near to the throne of grace that we may receive mercy and find grace to help in time of need. For every high priest chosen from among men is appointed to act on behalf of men in relation to God, to offer gifts and sacrifices for sins. He can deal gently with the ignorant and wayward since he himself is beset with weakness. Because of this, he's obligated to offer sacrifice for his own sins, just as he does for those of the people. And no one takes this honor for himself, but only when called by God, just as Aaron was. So also, Christ did not exalt himself to be made a high priest, but was appointed by him who said to him, You are my son, today I have begotten you. And he also says in another place, You are a priest forever after the order of Melchizedek. In the days of his flesh, Jesus offered up prayers and supplications with loud cries and tears to him who was able to save him from death. And he was heard because of his reverence. Although he was a son, he learned obedience through what he suffered. And being made perfect, he became the source of eternal salvation to all who obey him being designated by God a high priest after the order of Melchizedek. A few weeks ago, we talked about so many in the church who know Jesus as Savior. They they celebrate Easter. They know of his saving power, but they don't yet know him as Lord of their lives. So this morning and next week as well, we're going to be looking at the high priestly prayer of Jesus from John chapter 17. And as we enter into a time of worship before we dig into that scripture together, would you pray with me this morning? Father, it is good to be gathered together in this place as a body of believers. Lord, we just pray for our time together this morning, that you would clear our minds, clear out the distractions from this last week that we so often bring into this place that we bring into our time of worship and allow us right now to wholly fix our eyes on you and you alone. Father, we know that you are worthy of worship and we pray that the worship we offer this morning would be pleasing to you, that we would fix our eyes on you alone in this time. 
Father, we thank you for the, the simple truth that right now, seated at the right hand of God, is our great high priest who knows weakness just as we do, but still is perfect. Father, I thank you so much for the gift of Jesus. I thank you for who he is, for what he has done, and I thank you that even right now, his spirit is bringing this prayer to you. Lord, be with our time together this morning. We pray as we always do that in this place there would be a spirit of expectation that we're going to see your Holy Spirit move in this place and move in our lives. And we pray right now that no matter what happens during our time together this morning, that this would be a place where you are simply put on display and we get to watch as you will draw others to you. And we thank you for that. Father, we pray that you would sanctify us in the truth, and we know that the word of God is the truth, and we pray all these things this morning in Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Good morning, Corey. Good morning. It's good to see you here this morning. Thankful for God's faithfulness today. In Psalm 33, 4, it says, for the word of the Lord is upright. And all his work is done in faithfulness. He's faithful this morning. Let's all stand together as we come with grateful and thankful hearts, singing praise and worship to our almighty God this morning.
the one who makes a way, God. The one who brings life and life to the fullest. The one who brings joy, overflowing joy in our hearts and our minds and our souls, God. We sing to you this morning, Lord. We're thankful for who you are and what you do, God. Thank you for filling us with a joy, a joy of your salvation, God. We rejoice in the Almighty God, Almighty King. You're worthy, Lord, worthy of all praise, worthy of all worship. Amen.
We thank you for the rescue this morning. Thank you how you pull us out of the pit of despair and you put our feet on solid ground. And we stand on your promises. We stand on your truth, Lord. We stand on the rock of our salvation. And that rock is you, God. Move mightily in our hearts and our minds this morning, God. The living word of truth. Thank you for your word. Thank you for your promises, Lord. Thank you how you walk with us and you are with us, God, in everything, all situations. Lord, you're worthy. Amen. scripture muscle memory kicked in and I literally just typed acts and had to erase and go back and and change it to what we're actually looking at but I'm really excited these next two weeks uh, to look together at what we refer to as the high priestly prayer of Jesus in John chapter 17 throughout his ministry here on earth we get several recorded prayers from Jesus a big part of what he uh, taught the disciples is not just 
how, how to follow him and how that they live, but a big part of what he taught them is how to pray as well. Two years ago during our Sunday in the park as it started to get nice out, and I believe in May as well, we went verse by verse through, I would argue, Jesus' most well-known prayer, the Lord's Prayer. And we saw from the Lord's Prayer uh, not only what Jesus prayed to his Father for, but how he prayed and how he is still calling his disciples to pray today as well. But still, throughout the church, for, for many who have been followers of Jesus for so long, there's still, I think, at times this, this fear of praying in public because they feel like they don't know how to pray. And I feel like uh, talking about those who are fearful of praying in public is talking very similarly about those who are, are maybe shared to or scared to evangelize or are scared uh, to, to share their relationship with Jesus with others. And I'll say the same thing that I say when we talk about evangelism. We have to, to take the pressure off of ourselves of thinking that we have to know exactly the right things to say when we evangelize or when we pray. There is not a, a hidden secret to praying the right way or, or praying so that your prayers will definitely be answered. No, in fact, quite the opposite. If you are stumbling over your words, using maybe even the wrong words, perhaps too overcome by emotion to even get words out, still we have assurance that the Spirit of God knows our hearts Hears our prayers, even when our prayers are groanings too deep for words. He takes them before the Father, and the Father hears our prayers. So I'd urge you this morning, don't go on believing that you need to know what words to use, that you need to be eloquent for your prayer to be heard. Know that it is heard by the Father, even when you stumble and even when you feel overcome in prayer. Another reason uh, why people may say they don't know how to pray is simply a feeling of not knowing what to pray for. And this is something that not only the Lord's Prayer greatly helps us with, but the high priestly prayer does as well, as we'll see over these next two weeks. And we're going to split this prayer into two halves over the next two weeks. But to begin this morning, as we read through the first 13 verses of John chapter 17, I think it's important before we dig into the content of the prayer to see why we call it the high priestly prayer. I read from Hebrews this morning where the author of Hebrews refers to Jesus as our great high priest. And we're going to look this morning at what it means to give Jesus a title like that. What does that actually mean? And the thing that I love, before we read through the first half of John chapter 17, the thing that I love about this prayer is that while it is the longest recorded prayer of Jesus by quite a bit, you're still going to notice that the, the sentences, the requests being made are concise, even simple. But as we'll see, the depth to what he's asking for is, is massive. Turn with me this morning to John chapter 17, and we're going to look at the first 13 verses of the high priestly prayer. John writes this, when Jesus had spoken these words, he lifted up his eyes to heaven and said, Father, the hour has come. Glorify your son so that the son may glorify you, since you have given him authority over all flesh to give eternal life to all whom you have given him. And this is eternal life, that they know you, the only true God, and Jesus Christ whom you have sent. I glorified you on earth, having accomplished the work that you gave me to do. And now, Father, glorify me in your own presence with the glory that I had with you before the world existed. I have manifested your name to the people whom you gave me out of the world. Yours they were, and you gave them to me, and they have kept your word. Now they know that everything that you have given me is from you, for I have given them the words that you gave me, and they have received them and have come to know in truth that I came from you, and they have believed that you sent me. I am praying for them. I am not praying for the world, but for those whom you have given me, for they 
are yours. All mine are yours, and yours are mine, and I am glorified in them. And I am no longer in the world, but they are in the world. And I am coming to you. Holy Father, keep them in your name, which you have given me, that they may be one, even as we are one. While I was with them, I kept them in your name, which you have given me. I have guarded them, and not one of them has been lost, except the son of destruction, that the scripture might be fulfilled, Judas. But now I am coming to you, and these things I speak in the world, that they may have my joy fulfilled in themselves. The words that he had spoken just before this prayer, as John alludes to in verse 1, when Jesus had spoken these words, were powerful ones. Jesus is quickly coming to the end of his time on earth. He even alludes in chapter 16 to the fact that, listen, for the last three years, I've spoken to you in parables. I've spoken to you in figures of speech, but now I'm going to have to be direct. And he has told them that there is a time coming soon for the disciples when they will be scattered. He says, each to their own home a reference to the days following his death. But in the final verse of chapter 16, he says, I have said these things to you. I have told you about what is coming in the next few days, that in me you may have peace. In the world you will have tribulation, but take heart, I have overcome the world. And with those words having been spoken to the disciples to take heart because they're going to have trouble, they're going to have tribulation, with those words being spoken over them, probably daunting words to some of the disciples, he begins to pray to the Father. And he does so as one that we recognize from the author of Hebrews as our great high priest. And to understand what this means at an even basic level, we need to look at the functions of Aaron and his descendants in the Old Testament as the, as the priestly family of Israel. With Aaron, of course, being, he was never referred to it in his day, but Aaron being the first great high priest of Israel. And it was the high priests who could offer sacrifices to God that could atone for the sins of the people. It was the high priest alone that could once a year enter into the Holy of Holies and stand before the, the presence of God as it hovered on the mercy seat of the Ark of the Covenant. Only he could officiate the sacrifices made at his own or at another priest's consecration. The great high priest was the priest above all others. And so were the functions that were given to this person, holding the title of high priest for many centuries until finally in 70 AD, when the temple was destroyed. No more were given this title any longer. But of course, we know that for so long, the Holy of Holies that the great high priest, or I'm sorry, that the high priest had entered into over the last few centuries was devoid of the palpable presence of God. No more were the sacrifices they were offering after the once and for all sacrifice of Jesus, meaning anything at all. God had already said through his prophet Hosea, in Hosea 6.6, 6, many centuries before this, I desire steadfast love and not sacrifice, the knowledge of God rather than burnt offering. And in that desire to be loved by his people and his desire for steadfast love, we have Jesus, our great high priest. And now we get to observe how Jesus, how our great high priest goes to his father in prayer in this moment. When Jesus' uh, task of, of manifesting who God is on earth was completed, when, when his time was near, when his hour had come, and there was no more work to be done, but simply to wait as, it, as his hour had come. We noticed very clearly that Jesus turned to prayer. So much of Jesus' last day before his death on the cross was filled with prayer. Firstly, look at his, his posture as he prays to the Father. When we think of, of deep, intimate prayer, 
I think the first image that so often comes to mind is, is someone on their knees or someone laying on the ground, bowing before the presence of God the Father. And to be clear, that is still a good image. It's, it's not a bad thing to bow ourselves before God in prayer. However, Jesus, as his son, it says he lifts his eyes up in prayer. He looks to the Father in confidence that is knowing that his Father hears his voice. And church, to join Jesus in his victory is to be adopted into the family of God. And to be adopted and to be brought into that family tree means we can approach the throne of grace in much the same way and come to him and know that we are a son, know that we are a daughter. And it means that we too can come to the throne of grace and lift our eyes up to our Father, knowing that he hears us. And it says Jesus lifted up his eyes to heaven, and he begins with a simple but powerful request. Father, the hour has come. So many times Jesus has told his disciples to be careful in what they do, careful in what they say, because, and the reason he gave so often was his hour had not yet come. Now in John chapter 17, we're getting to a point when his hour had come. Jesus, or I'm sorry, Judas had slipped out earlier that evening. Things were in motion. Things were beginning to happen. The hour of the son has come. And he says, glorify your son that the son may glorify you. Since you have given him authority over all flesh to give eternal life to all whom you have given him. At first glance, it may seem strange that the first request of this prayer was first and foremost for Jesus to be glorified, a request that coming from most may seem selfish, but not for the Son of God, who had come to offer himself as the sacrificial lamb. Jesus' concern over glory was not a concern over him being glorified. No, he says, glorify the, your Son that the Son may glorify you. Jesus' concern for glory was not of himself. It was the concern for the glory of the Father himself. Simply put, Jesus is only able to glorify the Father through what is about to happen at Calvary if the Father has glorified him. By asking that the Father would glorify him, Jesus was asking his Father to make it plain to those around him that he was indeed the Messiah. He was indeed fully God and fully man. That he was the only one that could go to the cross and by his death and his resurrection alone would contain the power of death, hell, and the grave. And that is the incredible thing about this prayer, this first request. It was answered. And it was answered in a way that the world in that moment would see as shameful. The son was glorified by the cross and what took place on it. And we talk about so often what the cross meant to the people of the world at that time. That it was a place of humiliation. That it was a place of defeat. That it was a place of ending. But to believers who know what took place on the cross that day on Calvary, we see now the cross as a beacon of hope, a symbol of victory, a new beginning bought by the blood of Jesus because on the cross, he was glorified by the Father. And we are affirmed in knowing that is true because three days later, he rose. And that would not have happened if his death on the cross did not glorify him. Listen to the words of Charles Spurgeon referring to the cross of Christ. He says, yes, the father glorified his son even when it pleased him to bruise him and to put him to grief. With one hand he smote and with the other hand he glorified. There was power to crush, but there was also a power to sustain working at the self same time. The father glorified his son. One thing of note that I want us to see in Jesus' prayer is the fact that his request in verse 1, that he would be glorified, again, a request of, of glorification from the Father, is surrounded by reasons why. 
And, and I'll be honest, I'm not sure if this is something we, we do very often when we pray to God today. Why should he be glorified? Because his hour is upon him. Because by the Son being glorified, the Father will be glorified as well. Because authority had been given, had been granted for eternal life to be given to all those that the Father had given the Son. Because He is the only true God and His Son is the only true way to life. And finally, because by the Son's glorification, by Jesus' glorification on the cross, the work that the Father had sent his son to do was going to be completed. How often do we pray in this way? How often are our prayers a true conversation that you and I may have casually? How often do our, our prayers, our conversations with God even closely resemble our conversations with our earthly father? What the son is asking of the father here in prayer is big. It's a, it's a big request, but it's a worthwhile one. And he shows it in the reasons he tells the Father that he's asking for it. And let me be clear. God the Father knows why Jesus is asking that he would be glorified. He knows why Jesus is making this request. Still, Jesus verbalizes this in prayer. Because prayer is a conversation between a father and his children. And how often do you ask or make a big request of someone? How often do you ask for something that's so significant and then not give any reasons why? If I went to my dad today and said, Dad, listen, I, I, I really need $50,000 and I can't tell you why. I hope that he would dig into that a little bit more. And how often do we make big requests like that and, and not give any reason why? And it's much the same in prayer. When we come and make requests like this to God, we do so with a clear reason as to why. And he wants to hear that from us. I would encourage you as you pray this week in your, in your time of prayer, pray like this. Don't just make requests, but understand the why behind the request and verbalize it as well. I think of our times on, on Wednesday night when we're gathered here together in prayer, very often one of the main things we are praying about is brothers and sisters, people in our lives that we know that we're in need of healing. And, and we, we know why we pray that for them, because we love them and we want to see them healed. We don't want to see them in pain, but I would encourage, encourage you, verbalize that to the Father. Hear yourself give those reasons why in prayer as the Son does here. And again, after telling his Father why he should glorify him, he again prays the same thing but in a different way and a way that alludes to his pre-existence in human flesh. And now, Father, glorify me in your own presence with the glory that I had with you before the world existed. One of the factors that makes the Gospel of John stick out a little bit more over the synoptic Gospels is John had such a, a proclivity, such a leaning on emphasizing the glory of Jesus above all else. In a reading of the Gospel of John from from beginning to end, it becomes abundantly clear that Jesus not only has relationship with God, but that he is God. And he claimed it in many instances, just like he does here in verse five. Praying this further confirms his earlier claim from John chapter 10, that he and the Father are one, one of several direct references to his deity in the book of John. And he continues in verse six. I have manifested your name to the people whom you have given me out of the world. Yours they were, and you gave them to me, and they have kept your word. Now they know that everything that you have given me is from you. For I have given them the words that you gave me, and they have received them and have come to know in truth that I came from you and they have believed that you sent me. Jesus, at this moment of prayer, is referring exclusively to his disciples that are standing around him while he prays this. The, the 11 men standing around him as, 
as Judas has already left the evening. And listen to the incredible things that he says about the disciples. He says that they were God's first, but he has given them to Jesus, giving us just a, a small glimpse or hint into the, the working of the persons of the Trinity. Think of how many times in the last three years Jesus has seen the disciples slip up. He has seen them misunderstand what it is he's saying. He has seen them misspeak or just flat out sin at times. How many bickerings he's heard about who is going to sit closer to him when he's on his throne of glory. In a short time, and Jesus already knows this, in a short time, arguably his closest disciple, is going to swear to three different people that he never even knew who Jesus was. And still, he was looking to the Father in prayer and saying, they have kept your word. He was able to look at the disciples in spite of their weaknesses, in spite of their past failures, and still have a great hope <coughs> and know that from their future devotion to the work of Jesus, they were going to make his name known among the nations. Imagine Jesus looking around at these men that he loved so much, seeing the potential around him for the future of his church and thanking God for these men. It's an incredibly powerful and beautiful moment. But what I want us to look at more than anything here is the beginning of verse 6 when he says to the Father, I have manifested your name. That is quite a statement, but it's the statement that sums up the last three years of ministry that is now coming to an end for Jesus. All of the triumphs, all of the tribulations, all of the attempts on his life, and in looking back, he is saying to the Father, I didn't just tell them about your name. I didn't just teach them about who you were or about what you've done. No, to say that he manifested the name of God is to say in everything that he did, in everything that he said, he displayed who God was. Jesus is not just our great high priest. I would say he is the only true high priest, the final high priest, and the once and for all high priest. And we can say that with confidence this morning because of his sacrifice, because he was the one who manifested and displayed the nature of the Father by the Spirit of God. And that is what he wants us to see this morning. The same Spirit of God through which Jesus was able to say, I have manifested your name. That same Spirit resides in us and lays the same call in our lives as well. To not just make the name of God known. If that is where the responsibility stops, to simply uh, allow people to know that there is a God, then a dollar bill that says, in God we trust, could do our job for us. No, we are called to be like Jesus and to manifest the name of God, to display who he is to others and how we live and how we walk through our lives, to live like Jesus because to be in him is to carry that same spirit. Listen to the words of Paul in 2 Corinthians chapter 3. Are we beginning to commend ourselves again or do we need, as some do, letters of recommendation to you or from you? You yourselves are our letter of recommendation written on our hearts to be known and read by all. And you show that you are a letter from Christ delivered by us, written not with ink, but with the spirit of the living God, not on tablets of stone, but on tablets of human hearts. To, to carry the same spirit of God that was with Jesus during his years on this earth to, to have that same spirit indwelling us now is to understand that we too are living letters with a call on our lives to display the name and the nature of our God to a world that is dying and needs to hear of his truth. And in closing this morning, look 
starting at verse 11 with me at the final three verses. And I am no longer in the world, but they are in the world, and I am coming to you. Holy Father, keep them in your name, which you have given me, that they may be one just as we are one. While I was with them, I kept them in your name, which you have given me. I have guarded them, and not one of them has been lost except the son of destruction, that the scripture might be fulfilled. But now I am coming to you, and these things I speak in the world, that they may have my joy fulfilled in themselves. I want to be clear here that this prayer that he is praying to the Father right now is specifically a prayer for the 11 men standing around him. But that doesn't mean that his desire for them doesn't match his desire for all of his people or that we can't glean spiritual truths from the requests he makes to the Father here about his disciples. Jesus is praying from a position of knowing that he is leaving the physical world soon. That he will not always be physically present to keep his disciples focused in the right direction. And knowing this, he prays that not only God the Father would keep them in his name, but that they would be united just as he and the Father are united. This is big. The task at hand after Jesus' ascension was far too great for one person or even just a few people to be left. They needed all 11 of these men to be fully committed to the mission at hand and fully united around it. And it reminds me again of uh, 1 Peter chapter 3, the, the verses 8 and 9, the verses that for me are the lifeblood of everything that we do in this church. When Peter writes, finally all of you have unity of mind, sympathy, brotherly love, a tender heart and a humble mind. Do not repay evil for evil or reviling for reviling, but on the contrary, bless. For to this you were called that you may obtain a blessing. The unity that Jesus prays for his disciples here, make them one as I and the Father are one. The unity that he is calling them to here and praying over them doesn't mean uniformity. Jesus the Son and God the Father are one, but not the same, but yet the same, the beautiful mystery of the Trinity. But, and he's calling us to that unity, but it doesn't mean uniformity. It doesn't mean that every Christian is going to think exactly the same. It doesn't mean we're going to talk exactly the same. It doesn't mean we're going to act exactly the same. But it means that in all of that, we are still united in mission, united by the Spirit of God, and united in purpose to manifest the name of God to a world that so desperately needs to hear the truth of him. And in doing so, that they would have the joy of Jesus in being united together behind that purpose, behind that mission, being united in the Spirit of God means having the joy of Jesus fulfilled in everything that they did. And this is such a beautiful way for Jesus to pray for his disciples. The prophet Isaiah said, told us that the Messiah, that Jesus was a man of sorrows, someone acquainted with grief, but still he was a man of joy. Joy, that thing that is seldom talked about or seldom taken serious in the church today, and yet C.S. Lewis called joy this serious business of heaven. All too often we think so little of it. When it's missing in our lives, when the joy of the Father is missing in our lives, we make little to no effort to get it back. Sometimes it's so easy to be miserable, church. But I want you to hear it well this morning, that to be devoid of joy, to live a joyless life on this side of eternity is to live polar opposite of how Jesus is calling us to live. To live without joy is not a life of manifesting the name of God and how we live our lives. Joy was serious to Jesus and serious to his Father. 
And it's why in the midst of the high priestly prayer, a very serious time of prayer over his disciples before he's going to leave them, we see Jesus praying for a fulfillment of his joy in their lives. Jesus' joy was rooted in so much. Things that would bring us joy to remember today. Jesus' joy was rooted in the fact that he belonged to the Father and the Father was not going to fail him or leave him. It was joy from seeing the hand of God in everything he had done over the last three years of his life. It was joy that the will of the Father was being done in his life. Yes, there was, a, there was an anxiousness in the night before he went to the cross, but there was also a joy knowing that the salvation plan of God, the plan that was first spoken about as early as Genesis 3, was being fulfilled in the person of Jesus. And there was joy knowing that the Father had not abandoned his people. He had not left them to their sin, but he was making a way back. Church, if Jesus was so concerned that his disciples have joy in their lives, that he is taking time to lift this request to God in prayer, I can promise you this morning that he is concerned as well that we have his joy in our lives right now. This world so often is going to try to offer us a, a temporary happiness that, that seemingly fills the void or distracts us from a lack of joy in our lives. But only a life lived, making God known and manifesting his name in how we live and how we talk and how we walk, only that brings true and lasting joy to our lives. And if you're sitting here this morning and you're reflecting on where you are right now with God, and reflecting on your own life. And if you can look at your life right now and see a clear absence of joy, I urge you this morning to go to your Father in prayer, to dig into this book and remind yourself of just how much we can have joy in Him, and to get back to the heart of a child and how we think and how we talk and how we approach the things of God. God wills that we would have joy multiplied in our life. A life spent with him, a life lived in the spirit of God is a life of constantly multiplying joy, seeing his will done in our lives, making us more like Jesus every single day. It's not a life of having joy subtracted. And if the God that you serve is one that removes joy, and brings only feelings of seriousness, sorrows, melancholy, and rules, you're not serving the God of the Bible. You are serving a self-created God that comes from a place of law, and comes from a, reg a place of regulation, and comes from a place that still says, to get back to God, I have to work my way there. In God alone, we have freedom. And because of that, in God alone, we have true, lasting, and glorious joy. And the Son intercedes for his disciples here, and he intercedes for us now that we would continue to see his joy fulfilled in our lives. That is the great high priest that we have. He prays to be glorified so that the Father may be glorified. He prays for unity amongst his disciples. And he prays that in how we live, his joy would be fulfilled in us. That is our great high priest. As the worship team comes this morning, will you pray with me? Father, I find myself in awe every time I reflect on the fact that Right now, seated at the right hand of God the Father is a man. Seated there right now is Jesus, who intercedes on our behalf. Our great 
high priest, the last high priest, and the once and for all high priest. And we thank you that his sacrifice was enough. Father, I thank you that even in the midst of knowing what he would be going through in the very near future, still, he took this time to bring a prayer before you to lift up his disciples, to pray that the salvation plan of God would be fulfilled, that you would glorify him. Father, I thank you that we have a high priest who, who taught us how to approach the throne of grace with confidence, knowing that you hear us. And it's only by Jesus that we can, we can come to you right now as we are in prayer. Father, I thank you that on that day that he was glorified by you. And in turn, he glorified you in completing your salvation plan. Thank you that you made a way for us to come back. Father, we pray for the same things that Jesus prayed for his disciples right now. We pray that within the church, in a time where there is so much division, and so much tearing us apart, we pray that the church would continue to be a beacon of unity. That we're not going to, to think and act and talk all the same. It's just not going to happen. But still we are united in manifesting who you are to a world that so desperately needs to see it. That so desperately needs to know that they have not been left to their own devices. They have not been left in their sin. Because your grace finds us where we are and does not leave us there. And Father, more than anything this morning, we pray for a fulfillment of the joy of Jesus. Too often it's so easy to live this life in somberness, to live in melancholy, but you have called your people to joy. It doesn't mean that there's not going to be difficulties in this life. Certainly there will be. Jesus himself told us there would be tribulation in this world, but that we could take heart, that we could have joy because he has overcome it. Lord, continue to remind us of that truth. Again, we thank you for this time to be gathered together. Clear our hearts now as we worship and as we prepare to leave this place and go be the church to a world that so desperately needs it. We pray all these things this morning in Jesus' name. Amen. It's good news today, church, isn't it? It's good news that he gives us his spirit today. And the spirit can fill us with abundant joy as we live our life. We might find ourselves in a battle might find ourselves in chaotic moments, but you know what? He is our joy. The joy of the Lord is our salvation this morning. And so let's stand together. And let's sing about his goodness. About how we were found. He carries us through. God is our refuge and strength. And ever present help in times of trouble. As Psalm 46 1 says. So let's rest today in his joy.
You surround us with your arms of joy, God. Lord, no matter what we're going through, no matter what we face, we're reminded of the words you say, take heart, for I have overcome the world. Have courage, friends. That's what he's telling us. Seek him, seek joy. And so, Lord, this morning we seek you, we crave you, Jesus. We hunger and we thirst for you, Lord. Lord, this morning I'm reminded that you put streams in the wilderness and the desert, Lord. That you are our satisfaction. You are the joy that we that we find, God. And so, Lord, we're found by you, we're loved by you, but, Lord, we, we uh, trust in you and we hope in you, God. That you surround us, that you are our rock. Thank you for the joy that you bestow upon us, Lord. Thank you for salvation that you give to us. Thank you for the reminder this morning that there is power in the name of Jesus power to even have joy in the middle of circumstance, no matter what we're facing, God. Joy in the good times, joy in the bad times, Lord, because we know that you're able, God. You're able to move, Lord. So this morning, God, I pray that you would even put eternity in our hearts, Lord. You are the eternal one. You're never failing, never fading, God. You surround us with your love. You care for us, God. Thank you for how you care. Thank you for your living word of life. Thank you that you give us your word, give us your truth, your promises, then you implore us to live it out, God. To be hearers and doers of your word, to be active, Lord. So thank you for today's message. We thank you for the word of you, God. That you give us that joy to live out, Lord, and other people see that joy and they want more and more of it, God. Because it points directly in your direction of a God who gives a spirit. We can walk with that, Lord. Thank you, Jesus. We can walk with that. You're worthy of all praise. In your name I pray. Amen. Let's sing Rock of Ages. Of ages, cleft for me. Let me hide myself in thee. Let the water and the blood from thy wounded side which flow.
can't help but think this morning of the, how beautiful it is as we reflected not only in worship, but in opening the scripture together at who Jesus is. We sang that he's the Lamb of God who went to the cross and took on our sin and took on our shame. We reflected just a moment ago on the fact that he is the rock of ages that we can lean into, that he is a strong tower. And he's our great high priest that can go to the Father for us and we can enter into his presence through the Spirit of God and one that can sympathize with our weakness because he took on weakness. That is the beauty of who Jesus is. And there is so much joy that should come out when we reflect on who he is. So church, as we leave this morning, go knowing that Jesus goes before you and he leads the way. He goes behind you so you don't have to turn back. And he goes beside you as a friend. Knowing that about him, let us go. Go and have a great week.